If you have your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 16. This is the, we're going to finish the discourse that Jesus had. So this is the culmination. This is how he completes it all and brings it all to a, to a, a finale. And it's just, some, to me, it's just some wonderful stuff here. Did you come ready to receive today? Yeah. I, I mean, come on, let's, uh, did you come ready to receive today? You see, if you came ready, I know I'm going to preach good. Because it's not us. The Spirit does it. The Spirit does it when, when we come ready. He says, if you come hungry and thirsty, He's going to fill you. So just let's be, believe good things here. This is the culmination of what Jesus has said from the Lord's Supper till, till now. In the next chapter, He begins to uh, His prayer, and we're going to look at that. But... Uh, but here's how he, he finishes. The disciples had, had been talking about, wow, we don't know what you're saying. You're going to go, and then you're going to come back. It's going to be a little while, and we're not figuring it out. Well, here's Jesus' response to some of that uh, uh, things that they were saying. Verse 25, John 16, verse 25. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly, about who? About the Father. So he's been trying to get us to understand heaven. Heaven is like, he would say that, and then use an earthly example. He's been trying to show us who the Father is. Uh, remember the parable of the prodigal son? And, and he would just take things that were earthly. Consider the lily. Look at the birds. Uh, look at these, uh, these coins you have. And, you know, he, he would take all those earthly things trying to get you to understand heavenly. Why is that? Because that's all he could use. You can't understand heavenly. You don't have the spirit in you, so he had to use earthly things to try to give you an earthly picture so you could ascend a little bit to understand what heaven was. Now, we may not understand it exactly like that because we're on this side of the cross and the resurrection. If you're a Christian, you got the spirit in here already doing his work, but they didn't have the spirit inside doing that work. He was in Jesus and touching him. So Jesus used a lot of figurative language because he was trying to get earthly to understand heavenly. Come on, church, are you with me on this? He says, but now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop using this figuratively and I'm going to speak plainly to you. The time is coming well, that, that he's going to speak plainly. Well, he's dying tomorrow. Okay, so when is this plainly going to happen? After the death, the resurrection, and when the Spirit gets in here. You see, it's His Spirit that witnesses to my spirit that I'm a child of God. It's His Spirit. Remember, He said when the Holy Spirit comes, He will teach you how many things? All things. So the Spirit's going to come and teach you all things. You won't have to depend on all the figurative. Yet, with the Spirit, even the figurative becomes more powerful, right? Right? But the closer you get to God, the more, more the Spirit will speak plainly to you about who your Heavenly Father is, who Jesus is, who you are. And, and he's saying that that moment is coming. Now, for the rest of this, he's going to open up and just speak very plainly to them the best he can. So that in the future, when the Spirit's there, you can see some, some wonderful stuff here. I hope you can see it. Uh, I, I want you to see this in 1 Peter chapter 1. How many people during this time when Jesus was on the earth were closer to Jesus than Peter? Yet Peter couldn't figure it out. Peter thought he had it and said many times he thought he had it and then found out he was wrong. He got rebuked by Jesus one time saying, devil, get thee behind me. How, how would you like that to happen to you? And uh, Jesus, uh, Peter had just said that if everybody forsakes you, I'm, I'll die for you. If everybody else leaves, I'm going to hang in there. So th this is Peter, but he doesn't understand those things of God yet. He doesn't have the spirit in him. But now by the time he writes the letter, look at this wonderful thing that he writes. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So who's he talking about? He's talking about the Father. That's right, God the Father. So he didn't understand the Father here. Jesus had to use figurative language. But 
now by this letter, he understands so many wonderful, marvelous things about the Father. Look what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. How many like that? That means it's eternal. It won't fade away. And where is it? Oh, it's reserved in heaven. You mean I don't have it yet? No, you don't have it yet. It's reserved in heaven. Now, who did this thing about something reserved? It's the Father. The Father had a plan. Remember, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would have. Th that was the Father's plan. So Peter is now understanding the Father, and he says, blessed be the Father, because this was his idea. He sent Jesus by that resurrection. We have an inheritance now. It's, it's uh, in incorruptible, undefiled. It will not fade away. It's eternal. And where is it? Reserved in the heavens. You see, I told you we're going to a wedding day. It's why the world doesn't understand us very much. Because as hard as they look in the earthly, it's not here. We're happy about something that's still going to happen. We, you know, watch this. Reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power. Why? Where? Right here. People that Peter's talking to right here now in this life, we're being kept by the power of God. How? Through faith. Why do we have to have faith? Because we don't have it yet. Last time I looked, the people that don't believe in Jesus and the people that do are both growing old. <laughs> Last time I checked, people that believe in Jesus and people that don't are both dying in body. And they may say, you know, I spent my time going after things I wanted. I lived this life. I burnt the candle on both ends, you know, and I did. I, Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. But brother and sister, if you do it your way, I wouldn't want to, if that's how Frank ended his life, I don't want to be where Frank is. It's not about us doing it our way. It's in this life. We have a walk of faith toward the God we have been touched by. And why do we have faith? Because the Spirit of God gets in here and tells us about our future. And then it's the very power of God keeping us. What does the Bible say? For he who endures a little while, no, he who endures until the end shall be saved. What does this, this say? It's reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. When? Ready to be revealed at the last time. You see, the completeness of salvation and what it all means is the promise of your future, the promise of something that's incorruptible, the promise of something that will not fade away. See, salvation is there. But by the Spirit, I get to touch my salvation before I get there. I get to know about it. I get to be happy about it. We get to sing songs about it. And the world doesn't get it. They don't understand. They think it's maybe just a bunch of phoniness until the Spirit can open up their eyes and they can see the, the invisible Heavenly Father also. Come on, church, are you getting this? So Peter is saying, this is the Father. This is the Father's plan. He's prepared everything there. It's with him. And we get access to it by Jesus Christ because of the Father. It, it was what he did. Now watch, verse 26. John 16, verse 26. And this is Jesus talking. In that day you will ask in my name. Well, once again, well, what day is he talking about? After the death and the resurrection. In that day, you'll ask in my name. Who? The Father. You're going to ask the Father in my name. And I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. Now, then, now this is very important. I do not say to you that I'm going to pray the Father for you. Now, you got, you got your spiritual eyes open right now? Why, why was Jesus having to say that? Because in that corrupt earthly system, they only understood one thing about power. They, they only basically understood one thing. You know, there's that ruler or whoever it is, and us little, little people, we can't get to them. 
So how do you get to that ruler? You don't go directly to the ruler. You got to go find somebody else that's somehow in line up to the ruler. Are you getting me, church? So therefore, if, if you want to get to the, the king, you got to find somebody else who knows the king because you don't have any right to be there, right? So, so you, you're going to find somebody and say, hey, can you help me here? And then you go, okay, and you'll go talk to him because I can't, I can't talk to you. I got to have a, a go between. I got to have somebody else that'll do it because I can't, I can't get there and I can't talk to you because we, you know, we're not, so I got to talk to you. Now, see, a lot of Christians think in that realm. Matter of fact, that's how we see Jesus. We see Jesus as, as, uh, uh, as uh, Jesus, I can't go to him. I'm not, I'm not worthy at all. So I'm going to go to you and I'm going to say, and will you please beg him to, to hear my request? You see, here's how we pic picture the Father. We see the Father, he's got like little signs that say wrath and holy anger and big hammer and cast you to hell. And, and we see an angry God. And, and so we're going to come to God, and we don't want to come to God because we don't know him, and, and this is what he is, so we got to get somebody else to appease this God for us. And so... Jesus will he'll appease, he'll appease God and, and, and make it okay for us to be able to, to do something. And that's, that's, that's somewhat how we think because that's how earthly rulers are. It's trying to find an end to them by somebody else. You try to get access. Now, see, that's not God's way. That's not God's picture at all. It's an earthly picture. And if earthly visions of that continue, then we start getting a skewed thing about uh, who God is. Now, how many here, you don't have to be ashamed of this. I, I'm a Methodist background. And uh, you know what? Uh, I'm glad I had, a, I had that background. That they taught me about God. I, I believed in God through that background. But hallelujah, I don't have to defend that anymore because I've gone, gone on learning about God. Amen. And wherever you're at, don't defend that. You know, be thankful for it, but move on with God. Keep growing in God. You know, if we get stuck just protecting just a group itself, we, we don't get to learn all the wonderful things about God because we get stuck where we are, if you understand what I'm saying. And it, it doesn't mean you can't be in those groups, but, you know, it's like, it's like Crossroad. If you get stuck with Crossroad, you're going to be limited. You need to be at Crossroad and be free to go to God. If you understand what I'm saying. How many here have a Catholic background? You know, all right, Catholic background. Listen, what I'm about to say is not Catholic bashing. There are believers and people going after God in the Catholic church. Amen, there are. But we've all got to grow. We've all got to learn. We've all got to keep going, growing in God. So I'm just telling you something that Jesus addressed here. He said, you will pray in my name, but I am not telling you I'm going to be praying for you. I'm not going to be doing, doing it for you. And if you understand that, it fixes a whole lot of things because it deals with the earthly. So we use influence peddling in a sense. It's like, I can't get to Holy Father, so I'll go to the Son and, and get the Son to appease Him for me, and maybe I can get stuff by backwards dealing, if you understand. Here's the problem. Because if that's the earthly corrupt system I'm going to use, then I can't help it. It's going to keep on corrupting. In other words, if it's wrong, it's just going to continue to be wrong, and it's even going to get worse than that. Because here's what's happened. Well, if, I, if I'm not unworthy to talk to you, well, then in the end, guess what? That same corrupt system is going to say, I'm unworthy to talk to you too, because you're the son of God. Do you understand? So I can't talk to you either. So guess what? Now i got to find another go-between i got to find another person to access. And what happened? The mother of Mary became the access to the son. So in that thinking, somebody else is in. So now I'll go to Mary, pray to Mary. Mary, can you influence the son? You know, I, I'm not worthy to get to the father, and now I prove myself I can't even get to the son. So Mary, will you go and intercede for me? Can you convince the son so the son will be appeased, so the son will go to the father, so the father will be appeased? But here's the problem with that. The system will keep corrupting its own self. So guess what? Uh, when the pope declared Mary to be immaculate, 
then guess what? I'm not worthy to talk to her directly either. Come on, church, are you getting this? So now I, I can't go to the Father, so i got to find something else to the Son, but you're the Son of God, I can't go to that. And here's Mary. But now Mary's immaculate. I can't go to her either, so I'll go to Joseph. I'll go to the next saint. Come on, Catholics, you know what I'm talking about? I'll go to the next saint. And now we got a whole bunch of saints, and, and we're, now we're praying to those saints. And you know what? If they could give us just another lower one, we could pray to that one. It never stops. Is that what Jesus was trying to show us here? No. He was saying, you don't need any saints. You don't need Mary. You don't even need me. In other words, I don't have to convince the Father of anything. It was the Father's idea in the first place. Well, if I don't go to the saints and I don't go to Mary and I don't go to the Son, what do I do? Come boldly to the throne of grace and ask for help in time of need. It is God himself. This was his idea. He wanted you to have a place that you could come boldly and ask for what you need. How did you get to that place? Because Jesus died for you and rose again. Now you are attached to heaven, and he's glad that you are. He's not still mad at you. Don't you know what the cross did? The cross settled it for you. The cross paid the price. Now there's only one thing the Father wants to see when you come and approach him. Do you love his son? His son died for you. His son is your savior. Do you love him? Because if you love him. <laughs> oh, dear. This, this is my third time. I'm still getting happy. <laughs> look at this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Let, let's look at God. But God, or the Father, who is rich in mercy because of his great love. What kind of love? great love with which he loved us this great love that he gave us how did he give it through jesus even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive together with christ by grace you are saved by this great mercy by this great love and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places where in christ jesus that in the ages to come, or the place that does not fade away, eternity, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. How? In Christ Jesus. So it's the Father's plan. It's God's good pleasure to do this. He wants you there, and he did it all for you through his Son. His son paid the wrath. His son dealt with the fact of the lack of holiness. He, he took that. So it was settled at the cross. Remember, after the cross, there's only judgment for the devil. The devil lost. That's all that's coming. So if you, don't, if you hang out with God, judgment is gone. If you hang out with the devil, you got judgment coming. And, and see, both were dealt with already, but you get into either freedom or you get the devil's punishment. God has no wrath for you. You understand? How do we get wrath? If we become the children of wrath, meaning the sons of the devil, because the devil's going down, and if we put ourselves there, then we get his wrath. Our wrath was dealt with in, in, in the cross. So God has a wonderful plan for us, and we need to discover that. Look, look at this in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Now Peter was... Peter and John were the two closest ones to Jesus. So here's what John is saying about this. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. How many of you know the scriptures were written for you that you would not sin? They're all purpose for you to learn how to live, to be like the one who saved you, to learn how to be like Jesus, to be conformed to his image. The scriptures are written so you won't be a person who says your place is to be a sinner. No, your place is to be righteous, to be like him, to teach you to come out of sin, not to go into it. All right? So, my little children, I write this so you, so you will not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, there, there's somebody with the Father that he calls the advocate. 
we have, we have the advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. So if we mess up, if now you have to understand this. He's talking about sin that happens, but you're not leaving Jesus. Do you understand? In other words, your heart hasn't turned against God, but you sinned, you messed up, you got angry, you did whatever, you, you fell back, you know. But you can come to him. The chapter before, he said, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. Meaning, he, he wants you to have the plan. But here it says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Well, why is that important? Because look what he says. And he himself is the propitiation or the what? Substitution for your sin. How? On the cross. So on the cross, he took your sin. You need to remember that. He's already died for the sin. The sin issue settled. He is the substitution for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. So the sin issue is settled in Jesus. He took care of that. Remember, God's not mad at us anymore. There is no wrath sign there. Uh, he's actually happy to see you. We, it's our image that we can't go to, to, to the Father. So if Jesus is our advocate, not to appease the Father, then why is he there? It's not to appease the Father. It's to encourage you to come to the Father. See, Jesus is our cheerleader who says, come on, get there. You know, experience what I experienced. I prayed the Father. I got my answers. Now you experience it. You pray the Father. You get your answer. Your joy is going to be full. You're going to pray to God, the power of God's going to be on you. You're going to ask, and you're going to receive. Just like I asked and I received, he is your cheerleader, your advocate, because he is Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's taking care of your sin. You, there's no barrier between you and the Father, and how do you know that? Because Jesus is standing right there. Jesus assures you there's no barrier between you and Father God. He's not going to pray the Father for you. You're going to pray directly. And why is that? Because Jesus has taken care of it all. Now you can go in boldly to the throne of grace and ask for help in time of need. And Jesus wants you to get to a place that you begin to believe that if you ask, you will receive. See, we look at Jesus as separate from us. We look at it like he had some kind of thing we didn't have. And Jesus is spending all his time trying to convince you, no, you can do it just like me. The things I did, you can do. Why? Watch. The things I do, you shall do also. Why? Because I go to the Father. You see, you can do the things of God because he's gone to the Father. You, can, right after that verse when he says, because I go to the Father, he then says, ask and receive. Why am I going to ask now and receive? According to that, because he's gone to the Father. You can do the things I've done. Why? Well, how can I do that? Because I go to the Father. I'm standing there proof showing you you can do it. Now you ask and receive. I don't know, but this is getting good for me. Is it getting good for you? <laughs> All right. Verse uh, 27 of John 16. You're not going to ask me anything. I, I tell you, I, I mean, you're going to ask in my name, and I tell you, I am not going to pray for you. I'm not, I'm not going to pass it on. You're going to do it directly. Why? Verse 27, for the Father himself loves you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. And when you got Jesus in the right place, you can go to the Father and ask. You can go to the Father boldly because the Father loves you. Some of us, we don't know the love of a Father. Well, you need to discover this love. This is an incredible love. You need a higher step than Jesus? Well, there it is. It's the Father himself. Go directly to the source, the source of this whole plan, the source of this incredible love. It's the same place that Jesus went to. It's the same place that Jesus asked and he got, and now he gives it to you and says, now you go. I'm not going to pray for you. Get, get, get past that. Now you go boldly to the Father and you ask and you receive. And he says, then your joy will be full. 
your joy is going to be full. John uh, chapter 8, verse 42, look at this. And Jesus said to them, if God, and he's talking to the Pharisees here, we read this uh, quite a few months back. If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. If God was your father, you would love me. You see, John the Baptist had his ministry, and people came and they repented and got their hearts right with who? With God. And when Jesus shows up, where did a lot of those disciples go? They went with Jesus because Jesus said, if you got your heart right with the Father, you're going to know who I am. And remember those top disciples that John the Baptist had? Matter of fact, they were right there with John the Baptist when he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it says, From that point on, these disciples followed after Jesus. His, his top followers left at that moment. John said, I must decrease, he must increase. If you've got your heart right with the Father, you're going to recognize that he's of the Father too. And, and so here he's saying, uh, uh, the Father loves me, and if you've got things right with that, then uh, uh, you're, you're going to find out who he is. Look at verse 28. And I came forth from the Father and have come into the world Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. So now he's saying to them, I've come out of him. Everything about me is that spirit came over Mary and it was God himself. And I came forth out of God and now I've lived this life. And now I'm going to die and resurrect and go back to God. In, in a, 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 a unique way. Because, because understand, the first Adam... The first Adam sinned and gave sin to all of us, right? So he was our beginning, and he messed up. Now here comes Jesus, and he's not called the second Adam. He's called the last Adam, the last beginning, the, the last new start. And when did that new start begin? At the resurrection. Because he died for the past and what, what, what separated us from God, and then he resurrected as something new. He was the firstborn of a new creation, a new start, a last Adam never having to have another one again of something that will never fade. It will be eternal, and he was the first of many more to come. Everybody that believes in him now joins that last Adam and will never need another Adam, and it will be forever. Come on, church, you getting this? And so this is what Jesus came to do, and it is the Father's plan, and he's trying to get you to go directly to the Father. So he said, I've come from, and I'm going to. Look at this, Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So when he was born of Mary, he was in the prophesied bloodline. He was... Uh, Mary was of, this, the, of David's lineage, and now Jesus was through Mary. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So the resurrection from the dead is, is what, you know, he, he said on the earth he was the Son of God. There was different proofs and all that, but the resurrection proves he was. You can't keep God down. You can't keep God in a grave. And he was resurrected as that firstborn of the new creation and life is different uh, so how do we have this uh, thing reserved for us in heaven from the very first verse by the resurrection of Jesus Christ see the death took care of the problem of separation the resurrection gave us a future you got to understand that both were necessary that's why you can't just be saved by having a savior you have to have a Lord because the Lord is the, is the step of the resurrection to uh, connection with God. All right, and uh, verse 29 of John 16. And his disciples said to him, See, now you're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you've come forth from God. I think those words are just a pep rally. I, 
I think, you know, yes, he did speak plainly, and I think they're Paul parroting back to him what he said. I think they're hoping he doesn't leave. Hey, we got it. Don't leave. We got it figured out. Stay here. <laughs> Stay here. But they have not transferred yet to the Spirit. The Spirit's going to have to come and teach those incredible words to them. They're going to have to find it on the inside. I, I think this is just like rallying when Peter says, I'm going to stay there with you, Jesus. And they all say, yes, yes, we're going to stay there with you too. And they're all going to be gone in not too long. Look, look what Jesus says, verse 31. And Jesus answered them, oh, do you now believe? With just these few words and me speaking plain, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered each to his own, and you will leave me alone. Do you now believe, he said? Do you now believe? Look what he compared it to. True belief doesn't run away from God. It runs to him. See, a lot of people say they believe while they're running away from God, while they're living for the enemy. And they say they're believers. And Jesus said, are you going to, you, you now believe you're, you're going you're gonna to be there and you're going to support and you're going to, no, they're going to struggle. Why is it Jesus went to Peter himself and said, Peter, this is going to happen. Everybody's going to go. But when you're converted, when you turn, when you come back to your senses, then help all the brethren, strengthen the brethren. So you mean leaving is a sign I'm walking away from? Yeah. And he's got to come back and then strengthen everybody else. He says, I pray for you, Peter. When you come back, when you're converted, then strengthen everybody else. Help them too. See, true belief is when we have faith and walking with God. And that's why the true believer, even if they fall, will end up coming back. Because a true believer does not stay away from God and stay out there and think that's home and saying they got heaven. A true believer comes toward God, not away from him. That's a little extra piece for you, okay? <laughs> he says, and you will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Now here's Jesus. Everybody's going to leave him. Everybody's going to forsake him. Those that said, we'll be there, are going to not He's going to be seemingly earthly by himself. He'll say, but I'm not by myself. The Father's right here. The Father's with me. I'm in the midst of the Father's plan. He wasn't by himself when he was being whipped. He, he wasn't by himself when they laid him down on that piece of wood. He was not by himself when they hammered nails into his hands. He was able to say, because he was not by himself, because his father was there, he was still able to reveal the father's plan. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, look at this. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore... This is uh, Jesus speaking to them, and most believe this happened basically at Galilee, uh, or on the mountain there in the area of Galilee when, he, when 500 people saw him alive. And go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you how long? And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus is saying, by the Spirit of God, I'll be with you. Just like I understood the Father was with me. So I'm going to be with you so you can know the Father's with you also. Once again, Jesus Christ the righteous. I know everything's okay with the Father. And so I'm not going to be left alone either. And look at this in Hebrews chapter 13. Writing about the same event and the same words. Here's what it says. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. And let me just, let me just expand this. You ought to be con 
content no matter what situation you find yourself in. Paul said, I'm content whether I abound or whether I'm abased, meaning whether I got a lot, whether I don't have anything. You know, uh, he's content whether I'm in a place of hardship or whether things are going well right now. I'm content whether we've got a, an abundance of food or whether we're, we don't get anything to eat today. He, he is content. Listen, content is not just like you being happy. Content is that peace of God that is there, knowing that God knows exactly where you're at, knowing that God's in the midst of your hardship. See, when Joseph was being rejected by his brother, he had something from God that they didn't understand. When, when he was going to go to prison and all this rejection, yet God was using it all. And you can be content with God whatever, wherever you find yourself. See, we can, we can actually begin to preach a gospel that is about discontent. You know, that we, you know, we're always pushing towards something that's not, not there in your life. You know, you take Christianity and say, well, you're not going to be happy unless you're wealthy. You know, and, and like all these promises are for you to get rich. Now, how many of you know God can take people and make them rich? But you need to be content where you are, even if God's taking you there. Or else you won't be content until you are rich, and then you're really going to be messed up. If you don't learn contentment with God before he gives you stuff, you'll probably be in trouble with the stuff. Now, God wants to raise people up. He wants to give them position. He wants to give them power. How many of you know it's wonderful if good Christian people are in politics? It's wonderful if they are. But don't force your way there. Let God do it. Let God direct. Let God give you that spot, that place, that position. Because if you're not content, you won't let God do it. You've got to force your way in. And my dear, that's when you get messes. That's when Abraham gets an Ishmael. That's, that's when we don't get all that God has. So he's telling you, be content. How you find yourself. Why? For he, for his, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say the Lord is my help, helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Well, here's what man can do to you. They, he can kill you. People could kill you. And you know what? That's a what can they do to me? Because they can kill you. They can't steal the promise. They can kill you. They can't take your future. Your future is set. It's reserved in heaven. It will not fade away. It doesn't matter what anybody does to you. And therefore, whatever your situation is, you ought to learn to be content. Your contentment is not based on your present situation. It's based on the promise of God. Come on, church. Are you hearing me? Why, why are you content? You're not doing well. Man, are you talking? To, you don't know what I got. You know, I got it in here. I am blessed. I am on my way to something good. You know, we can look at the structure and world and we say, it's unfair. Bill Gates has all this stuff. Well, Bill Gates, just wait till I get to heaven and see what I got. <laughs> Yours is going to fade away. Mine's staying forever. You're going to lose it all. It'll be spread out, whatever, and all the things that don't... But if we are with God, if we hang into what he has, he has loved us enough to have something for us that is reserved and it will be there forever. Therefore, in this life, I begin to learn what Jesus learned. I can be content wherever I am. Every need was met. He prayed and it was there. God gave abundance. He did the work of God and God provided. And now, guess what? It's told us the same way. He will meet every need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Amen. Every need's going to be met. So verse 33, he then says this, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. So he's wrapping this whole conversation up, all these things that he said. And now he's saying, I've said all these things to you so that you can have peace. Peace. Once again, not the world's peace. You know what the world's peace is, you know. You know how about this one? Turn that thing off. I want some peace and quiet, you know. I want peace. A uh, lack of war we call peace. That, that's the, the world's thing. This peace is something that's on the inside. 
When the Holy Spirit comes, he's called the Spirit of Peace. Spirit of Peace. So it's that security that, that, that Jesus puts in here. Look at this, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. This peace is not of anything the world has. This peace is heavenly. It is of the Spirit of God himself. When you know what God has said, when you know what God has promised, and if you love the Son, you have a peace that passes all understanding. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So, don't be troubled. Why? Because I have peace. Yeah, but you. But look at this situation. Don't be troubled. Have peace. But you don't know how bad it is. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. Have peace. Yes, but were, Jesus, were you in there when the doctor said to me what he said? Don't be troubled. Have this peace. You see, what can man do to you? It's not based on anything about this world. It's based on the promises of heaven. Look what he says, he, where he finishes, verse 33. In the world, you will have tribulation. That does not say, in the world, you might have tribulation. There's no might about it. You're going to have tribulation. It's going to come, it's going to happen naturally, especially if you're a believer because the world doesn't like Jesus. But I'm telling you, in the world, in this earthly way, it's going to happen. Anybody getting older out there? <laughs> Woo, man, this getting older stuff you just starts happening. It's like, well, Lord, I mean... They got a whole proverb about it. Ecclesiastes wrote about it. You know, there's all this stuff about the, the delights of getting old, you know, meaning the trouble, the tribulation, just in getting old. How many of you know we can be content wherever we find ourselves? The great thing about this place that doesn't fade away, that is reserved, we're going to be the best that we are. I don't care. You, you can look at those old pictures. The best you ever were is going to be better there. You know, thank God. Now you got hope when you look in the mirror, right? <laughs> I, we're going to be the best that we are. And good grief. We're going to have hair there. <laughs> we are. We're going to have hair. Well, you know, how, how about knee replacements? No knee replacements. We're, we're, gonna not, we're not going to take any organs out anymore. It's going to be perfect. Nothing's going to stop. It's, nothing's going to fade away. It's going to be, wow. No acid reflux. <laughs> bye bye, Tums. I mean, this is heaven. This is, this is glory. This, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. I mean, that's the stuff that comes even if people aren't mad at me today. Th that stuff's going to happen. But a lot of us, we're afraid to get old. We're afraid to get old. We fight it tooth and nail. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. <laughs> but be of good cheer. I... I have overcome the world. Aren't you glad he said that? How did he overcome the world when he resurrected in a body that was perfect? A body that will be eternal. And he's the first of many more to come. Doesn't matter what they do to you, even if they kill you. Guess what? You got a body that's going to be just like his. He is overcome. You will overcome. You believe in him, then it's going to happen for you too. He's a son of God. You believe in him, you're going to be a son of God. You're going to be a daughter of God. I'm telling you, if you understand this, it goes beyond uh, parables. It goes beyond illustration. It is now spirit to spirit. If you know him, then let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
In this world, you're going to have trouble, tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome this world. Why don't you stand? Woo, amen. Man, these services have been good. All of them a little different. All of them. Saturday night was good. First service was good. This was good. But if you're here and the Spirit has opened up your eyes to your need for Christ, thank God He did. The Spirit will show you who Jesus is and you'll find out whether you really know Him or not. You'll find out if you've just been serving Him by showing up to a building or or because your mama or your daddy said so. He'll open up your eyes to your need of a Savior. Open up your eyes to your need of a Lord. If you've been in charge of your life and he hasn't, then you don't know him yet. He said, if you'll die to yourself, if you'll give up your life, you're going to find your life. If you'll let me be in charge, your whole life will be changed. If God's opened up your eyes to that and you know God's calling you, drawing you in, then brother, sister, I'll lead you in a prayer right now. And, you, and your brothers and sisters that are here that already understand it, they've been there, they're going to be happy for you and they will support you in the prayer. But you have to be bold. You have to confess Christ here and say, it's me, Pastor Rick. I need this prayer. I need to give my life to Jesus. So brother, sister, if that's you, then boldly raise that hand and we'll say this prayer with you, giving your heart, your life to God so you can understand this right now. Anybody here right now? Brother? Amen, brother. I see the hand. Amen. Anybody else? Don't want to miss anybody. We got one here. You got one over here? All right. Brother in the back. Is that a brother? Yeah. Got a brother in the back. Anybody else? Don't want to miss anybody. All right, praise God. Got a brother there in the back. Got a brother over here. You got somebody back there? Is there a hand back there? Is there a hand, sis? Oh, right there. Over here. Amen. <laughs> that is. Another brother? All right, awesome. Awesome, amen? Amen, praise God. All right. Well, praise God. I don't see any other hands. Well, look, uh, God knows why you raised your hand. God knows what he's doing in your heart right now. And you're about ready to go through an incredible event as God begins to open you up and to discover, for you to discover who he is in your life. So let's pray this together. Just pray this in faith, believing. We're all going to say it here together. Thank you, thank you Lord, for this day and the words that I've heard. You have used them to draw me to yourself. So right now, in front of all these witnesses, I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Come live in me. Thank you for dying for my sin and removing them out of the way. I turn from those sins and choose to live for you. Holy Spirit, come and fill me now and teach me the ways of Jesus that I might follow after him all the days of my life. And it's according to your very word that as I do this, I can confess by faith that I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen and amen and amen and amen and amen. amen. <laughs> Woo, yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. Now the ushers has, have given you a packet there and that uh, packet has helps to get started. But please, as soon as the service is over, come right up here to the front. Uh, we want to pray with you. We've got, we want to invest in that decision that you've done. If you need a Bible, we want to put one in your hands. But uh, if you don't have a place, if you don't have a home church that you've been fellowshipping in, you got one right now here if you want it. But we all say, we all say, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Amen. All right, church. You know what we got? Seven days before we get back here. 
What are we going to do with it? Let's have our heart open to God. He wants to continue to conform us to who He is, that we would learn and continue to grow, and that we would live this life out there, that we would boldly come to the throne of grace because the Father loves us. He loves us. And, and that we can believe and trust and walk in the Spirit in such a way that we're asking the very things and purposes of God. And when we see God answer our prayers, we can be full of His joy full of his peace, thankful that what we could not do for ourselves, our heavenly father purposed from the very beginning through Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Lord, thank you for the family here. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Continue to conform us, Lord, and empower us by your Holy Spirit to do the work you've called us to. May people out there be able to hear your voice loudly through the lives we live to your honor and to your glory. May we have the boldness to speak and to share when you give opportunity and we'll give you uh, glory and credit for everything that happens, Lord, because it was you, it was the Heavenly Father from the very beginning who planned to love us this way. We give you thanks and praise for it in Jesus' name and everybody said, Amen. Amen.